If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to James chapter 1. And we're going to be in verses 26 and 27 this morning. And we, we've been in James for a few weeks now, and James has been a, a great book, a challenging book. James doesn't pull his punches. That's what I love about James. James is direct. He's conf- confrontational. But he's also encouraging. What a, what a perfect time for us to go through the book of James as, as we are going through our own trials now as a church as a nation, even as a world. We've seen James encourage us that trials are for a purpose. They're to help us to learn steadfastness, perseverance, also patience. And as we grow in our, our steadfastness, and we grow in that endurance, trusting in the Lord, we, we are matured by these trials, by these, this pressure upon us. In chapter 1, he talked about how if we lack wisdom, we can pray for wisdom to understand our situation so that we can honor God through that situation, through those trials and circumstances. James has mentioned the specific trials of money and how the rich man and the poor man have have, uh, each individual trials. They both have circumstances that try their faith. And James has even talked about how when we are tried, it's, it's not that... When we are tempted and we fail in those trials, when we give in and it's because of our own inward lust and desires, it's not God's fault because God is good all the time. And then that brought us into this new section that we've been in for a few weeks in verses 19 through 27, which James wants you to understand that foundational to your faith, foundational to faithful living is the Word of God. And James has challenged us so far to to receive the Word, to accept the Word. We accept it not in anger, not resisting the work of the Holy Spirit as as the Holy Spirit convicts your heart of the sin and the remaining sin in your life. And he's told us that last week we should should obey the Word. We, We should do the Word. We should be doers of the Word. That should characterize our life. And so James has been working through this section, and he wants you to live out your faith. Because his his idea of faith is a faith that works, a faith that's demonstrated in your life. Let your actions show what's really in your heart. And now he he talked about responding and receiving the word, and and that brings us up today, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1. And one of my favorite shows to watch is I like to watch the Antiques Road Show. I know, some of you are chuckling already. I enjoy it. I'm a history guy. I enjoy watching these people bring their, their family heirlooms and things they've dug out of their garage, and they bring it up, and, and these, some of these things are worth thousands, and even, I've even seen a million dollars at times. And it's just junk sometimes that people have in their, in their yards, their garage, their, their attics. But it's also interesting to see these people that they, they're so excited because, you know, they, maybe they have a Ming vase or they have something they think is going to be worth so much money. And they, they bring it up to these, these inspectors and these experts. They examine the piece thoroughly and they, they turn it all upside down and they look at it. And then they, then they give them the bad news that, I'm sorry, this isn't genuine. It's an imitation. Well, today we're going to be looking at what it means to be a genuine doer of the Word. In fact, that's the title of my message, The Genuine Doer of the Word. And brethren, how easy it is for us to fall into the trap of a religious routine. You get up, you go to church on Sunday mornings, maybe you go to home group during the week, you sing some songs, you, you do communion, maybe you, you spend some time in the Word, you pray, you, you hang out with Christian friends, you got good theology, your church is really good. But in reality, all that is is moralism. All it is is it's outward religious activity without a right heart. How, how dangerous it is for us to fall into that trap. And that's what James is warning about today. He wants you to be a a doer of the Word, but a a genuine doer of the Word. Not just a doer that is, is focused in on external aspects of religion to try to please God. And so we're going to look at the deceived 
doer of the word this morning and the genuine doer of the word. So if you've got your Bibles open with me, let's go ahead and look at the verses 26 and 27. And James says, If anyone thinks he is religious, yet does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So James began this section and he starts out with a picture of the deceived doer, as I like to call him. And he says, if anyone thinks this, now he draws out this anyone, he's not particularly picking on one particular person that he's heard about, because remember, James is a circular letter. It's going out to many different churches. And so he says, look, if anyone, and he wants you to, to agree with him for the sake of argument, it's a conditional statement, but he says, if anyone thinks he is religious, okay? And the idea here, James, is, is tying in this, this, this section with the previous section, because he doesn't want you to think that he's a moralist. When he says in the previous section, the previous verses, that he wants you to be a doer of the word, he doesn't want you to focus on externals only. And that's why he said, if you think, if you have this mental evaluation of yourself based on your, your own personal conduct, in other words, if you believe you are right with God, if you believe you're a doer of the word and you can't control your tongue, then your religion is worthless. Your external activity is worthless. So when he says the person is religious, religious is just synonymous with being a doer of the Word. The word here specifically has to do with, with outward religious activity. Now, in this particular context of James, it was primarily a Jewish church. It wasn't a Gentile church yet like it's going to become. So we have a primarily Jewish context. And so they would have understood this religious activity had been the, the ceremonial and the outward actions they would have done as part of the Old Covenant, right? the sacrifices, the offerings, right? the giving, the alms, the tithing, okay? the, the prayer, the fasting. So he's talking about these, these outward things. If you think you're religious, if you have evaluated your life, and you said, you're a, you're, I'm a doer of the Word, I, I do all this religious stuff, as Christians, you, you attend church, you, you do the Lord's Supper, you give, you sing, maybe you listen to sermons. You, I'm doing all these things and God is pleased with me. James says, look, if you're focused on externals, you're not a genuine doer. He's not promoting moralism or, or just doing activity outwardly without the inward heart being right before the Lord. And he said, if you're, if you're focused on these things but you can't control your tongue, then your religion is worthless. Now, now, why does he throw in the tongue? It seems a little bit out of place. Well, there's a reason. Because what he's talking about is he's talking about bridling the tongue or, or controlling the tongue. It's a lifestyle of unrestrained speech. Now, we, we all slip up, right? Every Christian, we say things that we shouldn't, right? In anger and irritation, uh, not careful with our, our mouths at times, and we have to ask people's forgiveness. He's not talking about an occasional slip-up. He's talking about a lifestyle of unbridled speech, a lifestyle of uncontrolled speech. Well, my sister, uh, growing up, my sister raised horses. We had stables. I've ridden horses, cleaned stalls, that kind of thing. And when you, when you want to get on a horse, you put on the harness and the bridle and the bid. And, and it's interesting, you think about a little bitty bit in the horse's mouth can control that large animal and direct it where you want it to go. It's amazing for us as humans, a little bitty organ, the tongue, can have such a massive impact on a person's life. With our tongue, we can what? As James says later, we can bless God and praise God, and then what can we do? We can hurt others with our tongues. Is there an old saying back during World War II and even, well, even during World War I, loose lips sink ships? Well, I like to say loose lips sink relationships. You can destroy relationships with your tongue. It's a wildfire, as James says. And he says, look, if, if your tongue is unbridled and uncontrolled 
And you, you say what you want, and you, you, you don't have any desire to, to, to care what other people think and what, what other people's, uh, excuse me, their feelings about what you're wanting to say. And we're not talking about speaking the truth. We're talking about just hurtful things, gossip and slander, backbiting, criticism, those kind of things. But he says, if, if you're uncontrolled in your tongue, he said, you're deceiving yourself, verse 26, but deceives his own heart. Satan doesn't have to deceive you externally. You're deceiving yourself because you're focused in on the externals that are just merely religious activity. But your heart is wrong. Right? It's, it's a trick. You, you deceive yourself. It's misleading yourself. You're seducing yourself. You're, you've got thinking of faulty reasoning about yourself. You're evaluating yourself, ultimately, by your own standard. I'm okay with God. I'm right with God. I'm doing all these things for you, Lord. That's, kind of the, that's the attitude of the person. You, you, you're thinking that you're religious. You're a doer of the Word. But your tongue, and this is the key, the tongue demonstrates the truth of your heart. And that's James's point. You say you're religious. You say you're, you're, you're good with all this religious activity, but your tongue is unrestrained, but your tongue really shows your heart. And I'll give you some examples. Scripture condemns a gossip, Proverbs eleven thirteen. 13, a gossip reveals a secret, but a trustworthy person keeps a confidence. Well, a gossip is a, it's a disloyal and unloving heart towards another person. You're talking about them behind their back. You're slandering their character. Or criticizing or finding fault with others that, that shows a proud heart. You're, you're judging their life by your standards versus the Word of God. And you're criticizing them. You're calling attention to their faults. Or you're, you're, you have a complaining there's a complaining uh, speech out of your mouth. Well, it shows an ungrateful heart. You're not getting what you want. You're dissatisfied. You're discontent with what God has provided for you. Or maybe there's, there's lying coming out of your mouth. It shows a dishonest heart. Or maybe self-promotion. shows a self-centered heart. Filthiness shows an impure heart. And that's just a few examples. See, our speech reveals where our hearts really are. Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. See, so James is saying, you, you think you're good, you think you're a doer of the word, you think you're right with God, but yet your speech is uncontrolled, your speech is showing you and everyone else including the Lord, exactly what you truly are. You see, the tongue reveals what's in the heart of a person. Right? The, the person thinks they're all right. They, they're deceiving themselves continually, but their speech shows what they are not. They have an uncontrolled tongue, and it demonstrates an uncontrolled life. So what's a controlled life? If the idea is to control your speech, the idea is that the Holy Spirit is dominating your life is bearing fruit in your life. And one of the fruit or aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's discipline. It's being able to control your tongue. You know, you can always tell new, newer believers. And as they grow, because one of the things they struggle with, and we've all been there. If you come to Jesus Christ, you remember when you were a young believer, you, you weren't careful with your tongue, right? And, and, every, and those older believers would come alongside you and go, brother or sister, yeah, you know... You, You've been gossiping, or you know, you've been slandering, or you know, you've been saying some filthy things. But praise the Lord for those older believers. But but our speech shows our, our hearts. It's a lack of self-control that, that comes only through the Spirit's empowerment. So you want to see somebody who's truly a doer of the word. It's not just I'm going to obey what the Bible says externally. I'm going to obey God because I love God and I want to please God and I'm going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. If I was to tell you, hey, believers, go obey God's word, but not tell you that you're to be empowered and controlled by the Spirit, then that's moralism. I'm telling you to I live by a standard that you're to achieve on your own. And that's not true. That's not biblical. And it can't be done. We have God's Word implanted in our hearts 
written on our hearts when we're born again. Verse 18 says, In the exercise of His, his will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. Word brought forth, if you remember, is it means born again. He, he birthed us by the word, the gospel. Right? The Word of God is implanted in our hearts, and the Holy Spirit, as it interacts with the Word, bears fruit in our life as we're obedient. Ephesians 5, 19, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The idea here in Ephesians is it compares that with being drunk. If you're drunk, you're, you're controlled and you're dominated by alcohol. But instead, Paul says, instead of of living your life that way, live your life being controlled and dominated by the Spirit. The Spirit governs your life, governs your tongue, gives you the ability to, to resist gossip, resist slander, resist criticism. And you do that because you love another person you know, when, when I used to uh, do, do deliveries, the truck I had had a governor on it, a governor on the engine that prevented the engine from, prevented the truck from going faster than 65 miles an hour. Now, there are some, a few roads around where I used to live that, that were faster, excuse me, the speed limit was faster than that. It was right around 70 and even 75 at, at, at times on the, uh, on the freeway, on the highway. But this truck, you, you couldn't get it above 65, but I realized after a little while, my route, there was this large hill. And I realized that if I took, put the truck out of drive and I put it in neutral, I could get it to, to roll up to the speed limit. So rather than have all these cars flying by me, I was actually doing the speed limit, or riding along in the same speed of traffic. And I could maintain that speed because it was a very long, gradual hill, maintain, maintain that speed for a few, different, for a few miles. And then I, you, know, you slow down, you pop it back in gear, and you keep going. Well, the idea is that the governor on that truck is, to, is to so that you know, guys like me when I'm young don't speed around everywhere. Or like Josh, you know, who drive everywhere. But the governor in our lives is the Holy Spirit. Right? It helps us, it helps to, us to have self-control, to control our tongues. And he said, look, if, you, if you're living your life and, and you're doing all this religious activity, but you have no control then your religion is worthless. Because you think all the things that you're doing are great and God's pleased, but James says that if you're deceiving your own heart, this man's religion is worthless. It's, it's futile. In fact, it might as well be totally absent. It has no value to you. right? It, it fails in its purpose. And what's the purpose of all this religious activity? What? To honor the Lord, to glorify Him, to worship Him. But if you haven't got the right heart in it, it's futile. It's worthless. Matthew 5, 23, now Jesus is speaking in, the, in terms of anger between brothers, but the principle is still the same. And he says, if, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go and first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. The principle is the same. Is, is God wants you to have a right heart hearts. It's not moralism. In 1818, the U.S. government began work on a heavy fortification on the northern end of Lake Champlain on the border between U.S. and Canada because during the Revolutionary War, the War for American Independence and, and the War of 1812 against England, multiple times England invaded the northern territories of the United States through the Great Lakes up in the northern part of the state, or excuse me, of the country. Now, the U.S. decided, all right, well, we're going to build a fort. It's going to be a massive fort, octagonal, 125 cannons. It will, it will dominate the, a narrow pass that the ships have to go through from Canada to the United States in the Great Lakes. And they began work on this fort. They spent two years and $275,000, which is a lot of money, in 1818. But after two years, the surveyors saw that there was a problem. They were building the fort on the wrong side of the border. So they stopped the work, and the locals nicknamed the fort Fort Blunder. Brethren, doing religious activity is like the U.S. building a fort in Canada. It's worthless, right? 
It's worthless. James is warning of, of self-deception. He's, he's warning that and exhorting these believers to be doers of the word, but he wants to make sure they understand that, that he's not talking about just moralism, just religious activity for the sake of activity. So don't say you're a doer of the word if you're not doing the word with the right heart. That's how James tying in this section about, about religious activity. Because just doing religious activity on its own doesn't please God. Jesus says of Matthew 15, 8, that of the Pharisees, he says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The person that thinks they are a doer of the word and, and thinks they are, they are accepted by God, without a controlled tongue, they're deceiving themselves. Brethren, ask God to show you the sin in your heart. Ask God to, to show you if there's pride, selfishness. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you even now about sin in your life? When you study the Word and when you read the Word on your own or you go to home groups and, and, are you, and you're confronted with the Word, do you receive it? Do you respond to it in your hearts? Because it's not about outward activity alone. It's outward activity that comes from a, what? A faithful heart, an obedient heart, a right heart with the Lord. And that right heart comes, first of all, from a redeemed heart, right? James is he's talking to believers here, and he says, he says, brethren, several times he's talking to believers, he's assuming that you've been born again. Don't engage in religious activity and expect God to be pleased if your heart's not right. So that's, that's the deceived doer. Now let's look at the genuine doer. Verse 27, he says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So the genuine doer of the word, the, the pure and undefiled religion is to, what? is to love others and to hate sin. So he says, and by the way, just, just so I'm clear, because I don't want you to think I'm saying something I'm not. There's nothing wrong with religious activity. Right? James even said pure and undefiled religion. And the idea of religion is an, an expression of, of out, excuse me, expression of your heart in outward activity. Right? There's nothing wrong with religious activity. I mean, we, after all, we're part of the Christian religion. Right? Religion is just organized activity. I hear people say, oh, I just want to worship Jesus on my own, and I'm all good with the Lord, and I don't, I don't like all that religious religion, or I don't like all that religious, religious activity. But God has prescribed religious activity. In the Old Testament, you, you can't get apart, you can't get past that, excuse me, when you look at Numbers and Leviticus, and you, and you see the, the way that God has ordained the tabernacle and then the temple to be built in a specific way. He wants to be worshipped in a certain way. It's, in the Old Testament, all the offerings and sacrifices were an expression of, out, of inward faith. It was localized in Jerusalem. The, the, the sacrifices and the offerings didn't save those in the Old Testament. Salvation has always been by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. The righteous man shall live by faith. Paul quotes that in Romans chapter 1. Salvation has always been the same, by faith. Now, in the New Testament, we are, there are prescriptions, there are religious activity that we should, we should do. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word of God. 1 Timothy 4.13 says there's public reading of Scripture. Hebrews 10.25 says that the body of Christ is to meet regularly. Ephesians 5.19, we're to sing together in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 1 Corinthians 11.26 or, or, uh, outlines how we should do the Lord's Supper in a particular way. It's religious activity. So it, it, religion itself is not condemned. It's religion without the right heart. One thing to remember, too, is that God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 33 said that, that confusion and disorder in a, in a church service are satanic. God is a God of order. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 23, in the same chapter, he said that unbelievers shouldn't come into our worship services and think that we're crazy. There should be order. Right? There should be reverence. 
One thing we also have to remember when it comes to religious activity is that worshiping God is a privilege. Thinking that God is pleased with you just because you, you do religious activity in His name is foolish. Brethren, we get to worship the living God. We are reconciled to Him through Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is to be able to, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Not bound to have to go to Jerusalem and go to a temple, but worship Him corporately together. What a blessing that is. Well, well James says, look, pure and undefiled religion. He says, pure religion is it's free of moral pollution. There's a, there's a clean hands and a clean heart involved. As the psalmist says in Psalm 24.4, there, there's a, you're free to approach God and fellowship with Him. There's nothing that, that, that blocks you and separates you. That's why John says in, in 1 John 1.9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to, to, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness, forgive you and cleanse you. Right? It's this idea of we're right with God, we're, we're, we're pure, we're, we're clean. We're not filthy and dirty, as James has already said once, that we should throw off. But undefiled is not ritually, ritually excuse me, or morally stained by contact with evil. We're, we're keeping ourselves separate from the world, and he's going to elaborate that more in a moment. And notice that he adds in verse 27 that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father. Because he, it, ultimately it's God's standard. God is the one that is looking at your life. God is the one that, that's looking at your outward activity. And God knows if you're faking it. You may fool other people, but you can't fool God. Because it's pure and undefiled religion. It's outward expression of inward faith is... In the sight of God, He's the judge, He's the evaluator, He's the audience for our worship. And you can't hide from Him. My wife and I visited, before we had kids, Crater Lake in Oregon. Beautiful, beautiful lake. It's actually the, the collapsed cone of a volcano. And it's filled up with water and it's, it's beautiful. It's cobalt blue water. And it's one of the deepest lakes in is 594 meters deep. But what's cool about this, this uh, lake, and you can, you can take a trail and you can go down there and you walk in it, and they don't allow any, any powered boats or anything like that, but you can still go in and swim in it. But it's just, it's just beautifully pure. It's one of the purest lakes in the world with, with zero pollutants because it, it only gets more water. It only refills itself by snow and rain. There's no, no streams or rivers or anything that lead directly to it. And then the no water pours out of it. Only water that leaves is through evaporation. So it's, it's just so pure. James says that real religion is having a right heart, a pure heart before the Lord. Where we're, we're constantly having our hearts evaluated by the Word of God. Our hearts are, Holy Spirit is working in our life, prompting us to confess sin. Now, one thing I want you to make sure is I'm not talking about sinless perfection. That's impossible. There's only been one perfect man. His name is Jesus, right? Nobody can be perfect. But we're talking about a continual striving for holiness, uh, a responding appropriately and properly to the Holy Spirit's promptings as the a, as a Word of God convicts and the Word of God just cuts to our heart. That's, that's pure and undefiled religion. The pure and undefiled outward expression of a, of a truly right heart with the Lord. But James says, look, pure and undefiled religion is what? And he gives a couple examples. And it doesn't mean this to be uh, expansive. He's given a couple examples. But he says it's to visit orphans and widows. So basically what he's talking about here is a, is a loving others. Orphans, you think about orphans, these are, these are children that have no parents through any fault of their own. In, in those days, they would have, would have been, the parents have died or they would have been abandoned. You think about orphanage. So many orphanages, especially in the early part of the, the, ninth, the, excuse me, the 20th century, in the last part of the 19th century, were founded by Christian organizations. Christians see a need and they, and they work to, to help those that, that can't help themselves, that are destitute, right? that have no power. 
Same thing with widows. Widows in those days would have lost their their means of income and protection. They could have been taken advantage of by unscrupulous individuals. And they become poor and they needed help from family and others. We're talking about two groups that, that need help the most. It's showing them mercy, knowing that, that never could they reciprocate. That you, 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 whether it's monetary or whether it's physical. And, and notice he said visit. The idea in visit is, is, a, is, a, is a concentrated um, sorry, a concentrated concern for their needs, a thoughtful concern. It's not just acts of kindness, it's, it's repeated and considered care for those people that need it the most that can never reciprocate to you. That's love. You love somebody as more important than yourself. You want to help them. You, this, is, this is a doer of the word. You're living out the Word of God as you, as you love others more important than yourself. You love others because God loves them. And remember, love is an action verb. Love is kind. Love is patient. Right? Love does not hold account of wrong. Love believes all things, 1 Corinthians 13. It's mercy to others because we remember what? Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We've received great mercy from the Lord. How shall we not show mercy and love to others? And, and he knows, he says, in terms of their distress. You're in their lives, you're involved in their lives. You, you, you see when they're in trouble and, and you want to help them. No matter what it costs you, you are looking out for others' welfare. See, so you're loving others, you're living that out. You think about David in Psalm 41, if you look at Psalm 41, David has experienced God's great mercy, and he says, how can we not show that mercy towards others? So pure and undefiled religion is a love for others. It's also show it's, it's hatred of sin. Right? The word here is, is keep oneself unstained by the world. The word for keep is to, is to guard yourself, protect yourself. By being continually faithful to God's word, it, it's to be watchful and careful of the things that you know you're weak in. We all have sins in our life, areas in our life where we're particularly weak. Right? We, and you know those things. If you've walked with the Lord for a, a long time, you know where your weaknesses are. You know what areas in the life you have to be careful of. Because if you have an issue with alcohol, then, then maybe going into that pub is not a good idea. And you know it. Right? If you have a problem with, with internet pornography, maybe being alone on the internet is not a good thing at night. Right? Your problem with gossip, you know, maybe having accountability to help you. You know the areas that you are weak in. And it's keeping a watchful, a guarding attitude towards sin in this world. Right? He says, keep yourself unstained. Because that, that personal purity is what God wants. He wants you to be holy. Be holy for I am holy. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. He's quoting Leviticus. And he says, you, you keep yourself unstained by the world. And when he says world, he's talking about all of unredeemed humanity that's in rebellion against God. The world we live in that's controlled and, and dominated by Satan. Because that's the source of contamination. And we have to be careful that we don't, we don't take that filth and let it dirty us. It's dominated by Satan. It's the, it's the emphasis of God the Father. 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Right? Everything in this world is not of God. Right? He created it, but it lives in a fallen, rebellious state. That's why when James talks about wisdom, there's two types of wisdom. There's the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Paul re- uh, references that as well in 1 Corinthians. So he's talking about separation from the world. Now, one thing I need to say about separation, because different people have different convictions when it comes to how separate you should be as you you guard yourself and as you try to keep yourself unstained. We have have certain, like I said earlier, we know our own weaknesses, and there are certain convictions that we have in our own life, that certain prohibitions that we place on ourselves in order to protect our purity, protect our holiness, 
keep ourselves unstained, and that varies at times from family to family. They're called the gray areas in the Christian life. Paul speaks about that in Romans and 1 Corinthians, and there's general principles that apply. But we have to be generous and love one another. Right? For some that have a problem with alcohol, they'll never set foot in a pub. Where another person who doesn't have that issue, they may go into a pub. Right? There, there's, there, there's those examples. I mean, and, and they're replete. It, it's, it's those gray areas in our lives where you choose. I've known people that they don't go to the, the theater. And I've known people that do go to the theater. I've known people that celebrate Halloween and people who don't celebrate Halloween. Halloween excuse me. I've known people that don't put up a Christmas tree and that do put up a Christmas tree. You know, those, are, those are gray areas in the Christian life where we have to prefer one another and we have to, to be generous with one another and love one another and know that each individual person, when it comes to things that are, are expressly forbidden in Scripture, have to work out that on a family-by-family family basis. Now, when it comes to immorality, it's clear. Drunkenness is clear. There's things that the Bible says that are clearly wrong. But when it comes to separation, there's, there's some room in there for conscience sake before the Lord. You get whole denominations, we call them, we call them fundamentalists, where I'm from, fundies. You know, they, they emphasize the, an extreme separation. Right? They, they, don't, they don't even wear cultural clothing. They'll wear you know, long dresses for ladies and, and those slacks and button-down shirts for guys, and, and that's their normal clothes. Right? And you can go so far as the, the Quakers or the Amish where they basically pull themselves out of society and they live like they, they used to live in the 1800s. It's a separation. Now, when it comes to us as Christians, I believe we can go too far, whether it's fundamentalists or whether it's the Quakers, because we're still supposed to be in the world. We're not to be of the world. Right? We are to evangelize. We're not to separate ourselves to the point that we have, we're no earthly good. But when it comes to keeping ourselves unstained and, 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 and being careful, there, there is some variation for personal conscience. So we just want to make sure we're, we're loving others and we're not, we're not holding them to our own personal standards. We're holding to the standard of the Word of God. But it's a hatred of sin. So, so why should you keep yourself ha- unstained from the world? Well, well, God hates sin. That's the first thing. Proverbs 15, 9, The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but He loves him who pursues righteousness. James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So God hates sin, and, and all sin is against God first. I love what Achan said in Joshua 7, even though Achan, Achan we won't see Achan most likely in heaven, but Achan understood, even as a, as a pagan, even as, a, as an unbeliever, he understood, he says, truly I have sinned against the Lord. Sin is against God. David in Psalm 51, 4, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil. doesn't mean that David didn't sin against Uriah or Bathsheba, but it meant that first of all, every sin is a sin against God first. And then we remember why we want to keep ourselves unstained, because sin separates and sin destroys. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. James 1.15, and then when lust has, has been completed, it conceives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Sin separates and sin destroys. Now, Thomas Watson, in his book, The Doctrine of Repentance, he says that a holy man knows that all sin strikes at the holiness of God, at the glory of God, at the nature of God, at the being of God, and at the law of God, and therefore his heart should rise against that sin. He also says the believer looks upon every sin as a dishonor to God. He looks at sin as an enemy to Christ, as a a wound to the Spirit, as a reproach to the gospel, as a moth to his holiness. And therefore his heart and his hand are against every sin. Brethren, a genuine doer of the Word is someone who who loves others and he hates sin. 
He keeps and guards himself from the, the filthiness around him. He guards his eyes from lust, his heart from greed, his mind from pride. And unlike the deceived doer, his life is one of heartfelt obedience to the Word, who responds to the Word of God, who obeys the Word of God. It's, his, it's not just that he has to, but he wants to. Brethren, for the mature Christian knows that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's Hebrews 12. Brethren, in high school, I worked for a furniture store. And I remember delivering this brand new, beautiful leather sofa to this lady. And she, <laughs> she started refusing it. And we're, we're looking at her, and we've just worked hard to get this into her house and not damage it. And, and she's refusing, and she says, oh, look, there, there's, some, there's, some, uh, there's some breaks in the leather. There's some, there's some variations here and variations over here. And she's going over it with a fine-tuned comb. And, and I'm explaining to her and trying to explain to her that, ma'am, that this, these variations are normal. This is leather. It's, it's made from, from animal hide. And she stopped, and she looked me right in the eye, and she said, Leather's made from animals? I kind of kind of kind of give a kind of a, a controlled smile, like, uh, how do you respond to that? And I said, so I went on very seriously and I said, look, leather does come from animals. And, and, and I said, look, how do you know it comes from an animal? I said, well, the leather will speak and tell you, look, it smells like leather. It doesn't smell like plastic, like vinyl. I, I said, if, if you pour a little bit of water on it, it hasn't been treated, it will actually absorb a little bit of the water. It, it won't repel it like plastic. I said, I said, there's a, there's a look to it. There's a feel. I said, there's a water test. I said, there's actually a burn test. If you want to under the bottom and burn just a little tiny bit, I said, it'll smell like animal where, where vinyl will melt. And so I'm explaining this all to her. And I said, look, the leather will speak to its genuineness if you, if you know what to look for. Ended up talking her into to keeping it. But brethren, James wants you to live out your faith according to the Word of God. He, he wants you to desire to be a doer of the Word. He wants you to, to not be a deceived doer and, and, do, and be a simple moralist and, and do religious activity he wants you to be genuine. What you say is a telltale sign that speaks to your genuineness. Do you live a life that's controlled by the Word of God, that, that loves others more important than yourself? Do you live a life controlled by the Spirit in obedience to the Word of God that, that hates sin and, and keeps oneself unstained by the world? Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Brethren, true religion or the genuine doer demonstrates their new birth and spirit-filled life with their selfless love for others and hatred of sin. Live the sacrificial love and hatred for things of this world can only come from a right heart with God, a heart that has been changed and born again, a heart that is dominated and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Like once again, James challenges us. He exhorts us. He warns us to not be deceived by just doing religious activity. Brethren, don't resist the Spirit's work in your life. Don't resist the, the, the conviction of the Word of God. Respond by confession and repentance and, and grow in your faith and your love for Jesus Christ. Submit to the Holy Spirit's Word. And become a doer, a genuine doer of the Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank You for Your Word. Lord, we confess at times we, we go through the motions. And we know our heart's not right. Lord, we confess that how often do we do religious activity just because we are in a habit of doing it. Father, help us to have hearts that are pure and undefiled, that, that our religious activity may be an expression of the faith in our hearts. Give us strength to obey. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be a light in the darkness. Keep us from sin. Help us to resist temptation and, and flee from it. Lord, 
Help us to be holy for you are holy. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that you've given us and the conviction in our own hearts and lives. Pray that we would be responsive to you, O Holy Spirit. May God be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.